Thank you for attending the Student Organization Summit, and we hope you enjoy the following session. If you're viewing this workshop after the live premiere, make sure to visit our YouTube channel or official website to see an archive of all past discussions and workshops. And now, on to your presentation. All right, so my name is Adam. Uh, I am the chair of the Student Org Summit, and we had a cancellation last minute. So someone was going to present on advisor trainings. Uh, they left their job. Uh, and so they were kind of like, I can't present anymore. Uh, but this is such a hot topic. We wanted to still offer it. Um, so this is definitely going to be a crowdsourcing activity. Um, so we can kind of share what our campuses do, um, any sort of handbooks, videos, anything. Uh, so we're just going to kind of go around. I can start with what we're doing to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, I do want folks to share, even if they're not excited about what their campus offers. A lot of us are looking to improve, looking to do new things. So if you share, here's the training that we offer, but we know there's a lot we need to work on, that is great too, because there's probably a lot of people in a similar place. Um, so I'll just, I guess, dive in. Um, so I work at the University of California, Riverside, uh, which is about 23,000 students about an hour and a half outside of LA and San Diego, kind of up in the desert. Um, we do not mandate advisors on our campus. And so they have someone in our student life office. So we are their kind of dedicated person. But then if they want a staff or faculty advisor, they can, but they don't have to. So we've kind of been looking at how do we train and equip those kind of optional advisors. Um, we just launched a, I'm copying and pasting a link here while we're talking, um, a series of video trainings for advisors, um, which is kind of a three video set. So the playlist is in the chat. And then I'm going to archive all this. So when the video goes up on YouTube, I'll include a, you know, a Dropbox with all the files that you share, all the different links, all of that for you to look at. Um, but the playlist that I just put uh, has three trainings that we offer, but we don't mandate to advisors. So we're not at the place yet where we require them to do these trainings, but this is just a supplemental um, optional sort of thing that hopefully they watch. Um, and we cover topics that advisors tend to not know about. So one of those things is like Cleary reporting. Um, we have a lot of off-campus advisors, and so people that are you know, a pastor at a local church or the, you know, they work with a nonprofit, they are not associated with the university. So they don't get those mandated trainings that staff and faculty would get. So we cover uh, the Clery Act reporting, we cover hazing prevention. Um, we talk about campus processes. So what do your students need to be knowing about room reservations and getting funding um, and kind of what the advisor can and can't do in regards to those things? Because um, sometimes the advisor tries to initiate, like, I'm going to request funding, I'm going to get a room. It's like, you, you can't do that. Um, and so we tell them kind of what they can and can't do. Um, so those are just the first three videos we launched. The viewership is not great, uh, because it is optional. Uh, and so now we're trying to figure out how do we track and enforce these optional folks out in the community? How do we how can we stop them from advising a group, right? Like our campus is pretty loose with how that works. Um, so that's where we are. So um, does your training differ on group? Um, yes. And so the trainings that I put in that playlist um, is just kind of for student org advisors generally. There are other additional trainings that fraternity and sorority advisors probably have to go through. They're a little bit, um, the numbers are smaller and so they can actually try to enforce those trainings uh, where we have 500 clubs with you know alumni community members who knows who these advisors are um, and the question of why do we have optional um, advisors is it's an inherited thing I, i've been here 15 years and it was set in place long before me that um, we have our dedicated staff people but we don't have the time to be hands-on with all 500 groups all the time. So we trust that a faculty member in the English department is able to more adequately advise those groups. 
but we also can't get enough faculty or staff to mandate that each group gets an advisor. So we're in this kind of weird place where we don't want to say no to a student org because staff or faculty don't have the time uh, to assist them. And so we're in this weird place. Um, if we could, I would love to mandate that they have an advisor, but we're not at that place yet. Um, so now I'm going to ask for a brave volunteer that wants to share what they do. Uh, you can either put links in the chat or you can put files. Uh, so you can just upload a handbook, a document, whatever you use. Um, so either you can come off mute, you can raise your hand, however you want to engage. Um, Alex. <coughs> hey everyone, my name is Alex Bushry. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the coordinator for student organizations here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And as of right now, what we do is we actually do advisor verification in tandem with organization registration in the fall. Um, and then for new advisors that do roster updates or with organizations that do roster updates in the spring. Um, and so I can share, I guess, that what that looks like. We use Engage and we use a form and they just fill out the form in tandem with uh, roster updates. And so there are different sections, obviously. So we go over the advisor purpose and expectations that we have for them and what that looks like just so they can read, hopefully they read, um, what we hope that, you know, the role they will fill as a faculty staff advisor for a student organization, they understand, you know, what they're fulfilling. Um, and we also include the information for verification. So their name, um, the student organizations that they agree to advise, some of our advisors advise more than one. And so they can list all of that here. We also confirm that their supervisor um, approved them to be an advisor, just in case they um, did not receive that approval. We just want to make sure that they, their advisor is aware, or their supervisor is aware that they are serving in an additional capacity here at UAB. And then we confirm that they are a full-time faculty staff member, and we just like to know where they're at on campus. Additionally, we provide some advisor resources. I really enjoy the do's and don'ts, especially, you know, like making sure that they don't break promises, that they're not unavailable, that sort of thing. Just giving them some tips and tricks on how to be a good advisor. We do require two trainings. Um, and so that's the Campus Security Authority training and then the Cognito training. Um, and what they do is that Campus Police actually sends out the Campus Security training and then they do Cognito um, independently, and then they upload their training certificate to engage so that way we just keep track of their certification um, with that. We just required, started now requiring Cognito in addition to campus security. Um, in addition, we do some last information. So like how to use Engage um, and how to use Blazor Pulse because that is something that we use. That's an additional platform that we use for service opportunities. And then we, of course, have everything in the handbook. And what I can do is share a link to our handbook. Um, but it lays out specifically a section about organization advisors, the purpose, um, expectations, a link to the advisor verification form and how to fill it out and that sort of thing. And then we just kind of keep going again with you know, the expectations and some of the things, a little bit more in-depth of explanation in comparison to what's on the advisor verification form. And that's what we have, but something I think that we, you know, are definitely still looking to, um, you know, incorporate or enhance upon is like, we want them to still be continually engaging and being active within their organization. So we have a lot of like hands-off advisors that are just there and they fill out the form, they do the training, but they don't actually engage with their organization. And then we have some that are too engaging with their organization. And so uh, we're try trying to find that balance, but also continue to provide um, continuous support to our advisors, because I think that's something too, like we wanna make sure that we show that, that we appreciate the time that they're taking to do this and support our students. And that's something I think I'd love to learn is more about like, advisor appreciation and how we can do that for um, our student organization advisors. So there was a question. Um, so if an advisor doesn't do the training, so maybe what are the consequences? 
Does it stop organizations from registering? What does that look like? So as of right now, we don't have any consequences. We do try to make it mandatory, however, comma. <laughs> we do know that they are busy and they probably sometimes forget. Also, times there are times where, um, like for example, with the Cognito training, um, they just don't upload their cert certification. However, our um, student counseling services, they monitor everyone that goes through Cognito training so they can pull a report to see all the faculty staff members across UAB who have completed the training and they just may have not completed the or uploaded the certification to engage. So we try not to make that hinder any student organization for re-registering because it's not their fault, but we send out more reminders and try to keep track of those who haven't and those who have, so that way we know who has done the training and who hasn't. So Alex, my other question was, um, we used Engage previously, sorry, I'll turn my camera on in the kitchen. Um, we used Engage previously and um, found it was difficult if like, they weren't loaded into the system or they weren't using the system often and they're like what is this system why do i have to use it blah 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 um do you have those issues or is it just a form out there anyone can have access to it is how have you worked that out yeah so it's a it's set to where public users can access the form so that way they don't have to like go through duo and all of that then log into their information because after that they just don't do it um, and so we just set it to a public user and we still capture their email and name through that even because they're submitting the um, the form um, and so that helps us get do you know make sure that they're not struggling accessing the form um, and then also um, there was something else I was going to share and I completely forgot but basically they fill out the form and they're they can be a public user so that way they don't have to log in and then um, that's why we also had a video tutorial as well. Um, and what we do is actually we encourage the student leaders to reach out to their advisors to complete that form to so that they know that it's a required piece of registration that it's important because they want to confirm that their advisor is serving in this role. That's how we also capture student organizations that are at saying that this is going to be their advisor, but their advisor never agreed to this. So that's another great way to capture that. And then there's a question from Jean. Um, I don't know if it was specifically for Alex, but maybe who handles disciplinary concerns with student orgs? I think that might be addressed. Uh, we have a half hour block and there's a conversation about collaborating with Latina students and conduct offices, uh, which I think will cover student orgs and discipline and who is doing what on different campuses. So I think that's what that discussion is going to be about, because um, I don't know if that makes sense for right now because advisors are really kind of probably out of the discipline process. Um, so I think that might be a good workshop to go to. Um, I think it's at the next hour, I think is when that's happening uh, or after the break. Um, yeah, so who wants to share next? Kenneth. Good morning, good morning. I didn't want to share. I actually had a question for Alex. Hey, Alex. Hey. I appreciate you bringing it up um, about uh, advisor appreciation. You know, we are overworked and we stretch. And I really, I really believe that we should try to find a way to appreciate our advisors. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you handle organization accounts on your campus? You mean like financial accounts? Hmm? Do you mean like financial accounts? Financial accounts, right. Okay, so um, it depends on how they're receiving funding. So obviously if they're a university funded organization, they're receiving funds through a department and so that the department manages it. And then if it's a registered student organization that receives funding through you know, um, their own means, so like fundraising and that sort of thing, they mm -hmm. work specifically with USGA or graduate student government to manage like reimbursements for things that they're paying for. And then they create their own bank account actually um, for their student organization. So it's actually like a business account for their student group. And that way they can manage their finances, but also get reimbursed for things like bigger expenses mm -hmm. through our student government organizations. So does your campus have, have any stipulation on where that account has to be? Cause I know with some organizations, mm -hmm. I, I think with, Pan Hellenic because they are a national organization, they can have the outside uh, banking information, yeah, banking account rather. 
-hmm. but just trying to find the means of having our RSOs go through our campus. How, how can we, I guess, start that process and how does that process look? Yeah, so it's a bit of an in-depth process getting them to understand all of the steps to creating um, a bank account because it's not necessarily the easiest thing when you're just a new organization and some or like banks require you to actually have like a minimum deposit of like, I don't know, $250 or something like that. That's what we've heard from like regions. Mm -hmm. um, is to like, that's what they require to create the account. And some, you know, new organizations just don't have that. So they go to like, uh, BBVA or PNC company or whichever they just transitioned to. Um, and um, for, but specifically for um, FSL groups, I actually don't oversee FSL groups. We have an entirely uh, different individual in our office that oversees FSL groups. So I can't speak on behalf of how they manage their finances. I'm, I'm sure it's a, a different process, um, but in relation to advisors, we actually require or so, well, we don't require, we just highly suggest that their advisors are looped in on the process of any financing. Um, and so that way, you know, if they have to sign off on documents that their advisor does it because they're a more longstanding individual in their organization. So like if you graduate, you still have the like updated records of your finances. Um, and it's not tied to an individual who's no longer associated with UAB. Thank you so much, Alice. I appreciate that. Yeah, so Allison is willing to share now. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am a student affairs specialist at Purdue University. So um, I also want to touch base on the banking and money stuff because I feel like Purdue is just special in lots of ways. Um, but for our advisor specifically, so we do require um, every recognized student organization to have a faculty or staff advisor. Um, that person has to be like full-time status. Um, for hourly staff, um, we make like case-by-case -case exemptions based on their supervisor, um, just because, you know, their time is managed a little bit differently. Um, in regards to trainings, they are required to complete a training through our office, um, which is a self-guided PowerPoint and quiz um, that goes over, you know, what they need to know as an advisor, um, the like what you can and can't do, what you're held responsible to, um, what things they need prior, like for registration and other aspects of like student org functioning. Um, and then they are required to complete what we call an advisor agreement form. Um, and that is signed between the advisor and the president on a yearly basis or any time one of those two people change. Um, that agreement form is actually has been like run through legal. Um, and it is a document that they are held to um, if an organization does something or the advisor was aware of X, Y, Z when something happened. Um, so that is also part of the reason why we require every single organization to have a faculty or staff advisor um, because we can hold them accountable. So um, it is a little bit higher stakes. It is tied to our registration where they cannot re-register unless they have that advisor agreement form signed. The great part of it, about that is that we're not double checking the trainings. Um, so if they sign off on the advisor agreement form that they have completed the training, then that's the word we're taking for. That's kind of like they're accepting that liability if we choose to lie, um, which most of them I think don't. So that comes in, they just have to have that uploaded into their registration in order to re-register. Um, on the financial piece, our advisors actually um, have access to the student orgs account. So we actually have a business office that's dedicated to student orgs. Um, and every recognized student organization has the ability to open up an account. Um, we state that if they're handling money in any way, they should be opening an account because all financial transactions by recognized student orgs should go through what we call the BOSO office. Um, when it comes to our FS, we have a C for cooperative housing life um, organizations. Um, those that have um, houses on our um, have like housing corporations, they do not need to have um, their bank accounts come through Purdue because they have a financial corporation that handles their finances. So a lot of our NPHC organizations, MGC organizations that don't fall into those categories do have accounts uh, through the 
again, Bozo office that runs all of that. Um, and their advisor, their primary advisor is what we refer to like their faculty or staff advisor is the person who has access to that along with the president and treasurer. Um, every organization is allowed to add an additional advisor or many. Um, if they are Purdue faculty or staff, they are required to also complete that advisor agreement form. If they are not paid employees by Purdue, then we just need their name and like email address to keep track of them. Because again, we keep the other advisor accountable. Um, I will share the form through the chat a little bit. Um, I know one of the things that we've try to do um, outside of this training is have like an in-person gathering. Obviously the past couple of years has made it a little bit difficult, um, but we do invite um, advisors in the essentially a lunch and uh, learn format where we go over, you know, their questions, um, a presentation as well that our director typically does um, about the role of an advisor. This past year, um, we have started a sign up form for interested folks that want to become advisors that we've been trying to push in um, new faculty, new staff kind of orientation, um, those info fairs that um, that way folks can watch a YouTube video that we've also created about the role of an advisor um, so that they have a little bit of an insight and then they fill out their information and what type of organization they are interested in advising. Um, that information is housed in our office. So if a student org reaches out because they're struggling to find an advisor, um, they tell us about their org and then we will go through the list and pull like candidates that match and send that. So we don't give like full access to this list all the time so that everyone's getting you know, an email every day about it. Um, but yeah. Awesome, uh, Maggie. Yeah, so my name is Maggie Hole, and I am the Student and Organizational Leadership Coordinator in the Office of Student Life here at Valdosta State University. Um, I'm the first person who is dedicated full-time to student organizations. Um, so a lot of the stuff was kind of swept under the rug a lot um, before, um, just because right, people don't have time necessarily for student organizations. So um, a lot of what I've been trying to do is get rid of paper advisors is what we call them here. Advisors who are written down that they advise and they actually don't. Um, and so a lot of what I have done is an advisor in, uh, an advisor verification form, um, kind of like Alex has. Um, it's been approved by legal. Um, they understand the ramifications um, of being an advisor. And luckily enough for us, we have a requirement for our tenure here that you have to volunteer in some way. And so a lot of faculty and staff members will choose um, to do it this way instead of um, another way, um, just because it's a little easier and you get to work with students. Um, and so I can definitely share that. We use Presence, so that's what um, our platform will be on. Um, and then we also have a, um, if you're interested form, um, like a, a lot like Allison has as well, of uh, right, here is all of our student groups, here's what each category is, and I have the advisors select a category instead of it just being like, I'm signing up to be an advisor. Um, so then I kind of know what their interest is because some people aren't comfortable, right, advising a religious organization, but they're more than willing to advise um, our Greek organizations here. And so it's just kind of picking and choosing what um, they might be. Um, and then it's a mutual selection process. So I um, set up meetings for them to have conversations about if they want to be the advisor or not, because I don't ever want it to be, here's your advisor and I don't care if you don't get along or not kind of thing. Um, and I also have conversations with our advisors of right you can be kicked off being their advisor at any moment in time if they vote that way. Um, and I think that's really hard for a lot of our advisors to understand that like, right, you are not guaranteed this role on our campus. Um, and so a lot of our advisors are overly involved um, to where, right, they're booking spaces on campus and all of those. So I'm working on creating trainings to kind of solve that. Um, um, and then as well as speaking to the advisor appreciation, we did a luncheon um, where I fed them. I gave them updates about what was happening. I introduced myself and then I just let them kind of mingle and chat. I think a lot of them just want time that they can have conversations with each other instead of it being um, this whole forced situation at times. Um, and then I also um, did a thank you note. I designed it on Canva and got it printed um, through our printing services. And me and my GA hand signed each and every one of them and sent it to all of our advisors. 
seems like a small thing, but I'm very into handwritten notes and I think it can go really far for our advisors if right, they've never gotten an appreciation because right, being an advisor is hard work. Um, and so I really want to show their appreciation, uh, show my appreciation for them, because um, I would not be able to do my job with all, we only have 130 here. Um, and so that's enough right now, um, but we're working on getting more. So um, but I can put those couple items in the chat. So maybe what I would do. Yeah, I appreciate people touching on uh, kind of the in-person stuff. Uh, that's never really worked for us. We've done a lot of advisor socials and receptions that are just empty rooms or one or two people show up. Uh, so I think that's why we maybe veered away from that into more asynchronous, watch this training when you can sort of things. But I'd love to hear if there's people that have figured out a way to get advisors there in person and get them interacting, a lot of head shaking, okay. <laughs> um, so anyone else want to share what's going on on their campus? Uh, Dan, go for it. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dan Burkeen, uh, coordinator of student organizations and leadership development at uh, Cal State Monterey Bay. Um, one thing that we do on our campus that's, um, that's actually totally faculty driven, which was a shock and was uh, a really helpful thing to get us started. Um, was we have these things called co-ops, which are like kind of learning things for learning groups for our faculty. And uh, they actually started one around advising organizations. And then they invited us to the table um, to be there at that and kind of help educate them. Um, it was, it's, it's, it was like a total surprise to us. And it's been one of the best relationship builders we've ever had uh, with advisors. And so they do it every, every other year. Um, they do it. And then, and so it's, we have like, luckily a core group of advisors in our kind of uh, school of business that, that always bring it, but then they always bring other people. And so I think the first time we ran it, we had like five or six. The second time we ran it, we had 10. And I think this year when we're running it, we have almost 20 in it. Um, and it's just individuals who are interested in, and then the other piece, and I heard somebody talk about this earlier, which is when they're going for tenure, um, you know, they need to show university service and this is an avenue that they that they kind of uh, advocated for is like go be an advisor um and this is a way to show university service and, and so they they help navigate they help the other professors that are going for uh, tenure navigate that process and show that they're advising um and so it's been a really fruitful relationship between the two of us so um yeah i think that's that's something that and I don't know if you if you don't have co-ops or you don't have some kind of advisor, you know, like a, or some kind of faculty training. Um, but that's what we have on, like you know, just kind of faculty, uh, you know, uh, project kind of things they get together and work on how to be a better professor. Um, and this is just one of the things that they brought up, and it's been super, super cool on our campus. So awesome! Thank you, Dan, uh, Allie. Yeah, um, for our uh, advisors, um, I'm the assistant director at the University of Houston. She, hers, so sorry. Um, for our advisors here at UH, we have about um, 450 to 500 student organizations at the moment. So there's a good amount of advisors and you know other types of people that are involved. And so um, for a while, we did a lot of like asynchronous and online education and learning and what we did, I can share it with you. Um, we made a resource page, um, not only for advisors, but we have one for student organizations as well, as well as our other areas in our office. And so we put our resource guide like all online in like smaller formats, which we found really helpful. We are adding some digital resources, tips, tricks, some, you know, national things as well. Um, our newsletters go on here. Sorry, they haven't been updated in a while, but I'm working on that a couple months into this new assistant director role. And we also have our like risk management. These are the required videos that we um, send to advisors. And um, we also have them on YouTube. That's why they're here. And so when they want to become an advisor, uh, we share this with them um, through like a single sign on basically, but it's also available publicly as well. And um, they have to complete these videos. It used to be like some weird online like tracking thing. We just made it into a quiz. And if they get 100%, then they're done. Um, inside our organization registration process, we use Engage. Um, so we require them, the students, the student leaders, 
to upload their advisor information as well with that signed and completed uh, agreement form here. So we make them include all of their information. We also make them add it into their roster, which is on Engage. So it has to be like someone who's in the system, if that makes sense. Um, we also, this is a look at our advisor agreement form. It's also public and online. So I'll drop these links in the chat, um, but basically similar to other places, we just require that this be filled out every year. Um, so they don't have to do the trainings every year. That's a one and done thing when you're at UH, but they do have to re-sign this form every year to acknowledge that they still agree to all of that information as well. Um, we do have an advisor network where we provide like round tables, so similar to like the luncheon that was talked about, um, but something else that we're doing um, that we've done in the past has been really helpful that was great in person and virtual was like a half day experience that we call advisor boot camp. Um, and this is like targeted to new advisors, but we invite everyone, of course. Um, the attendance isn't awesome, but it's more than we've had in the past. So we've had like 30 to 40 people come, which is more than the 10 from before. So our advisor boot camp is a session where we get like panels and we have different discussions. I can show you our tentative outline for this year, but trust me, I'm really working on it. Um, we do this in January, um, typically so that um, we can include some new advisors that's not during our like peak organization registration time or the start of school. So it's kind of that midway time frame. Um, and this was our virtual online, we had come and go, but we do uh, like an advising 101, like someone else had stated, um, something about risk management. Um, we did a fundraising um, and funding before, so we're trying to decide which one would be better. Um, this was clearly during COVID times, managing the team at the distance, but I think now we'll probably focus on some like conflict management since students are having a hard time, you know, interacting with each other. I'm sure you've all seen it, the good old coming back from COVID times. Um, we have, of course, any kind of new policies and then kind of a fourth session of whatever we want, like continuity, transition, whatever we like. And so we'll have a lunch with a Q&A as well. So this like half day experience was really, really helpful. People loved it. They got to network with each other and it was only like a half day on like a Friday or something. I think this one is not on a Friday. I didn't book it in time, so, but you know. That's what we are doing right now for our um, advisors. I definitely think there's room for improvement. I love the interest form idea and it's something that I really want to implement. So thanks everyone for sharing that. Um, but that's what UH is doing. Oh yes, let me share the link, sorry. Yeah, that is some great stuff. Um, who wants to go next? Any sort of trainings, documents, forms? Anyone else want to share that hasn't gone? I'd like to share something. Um, thank you, Allie. Um, that's hard to follow up. I was like, oh my goodness, I don't even know if I can. <laughs> um, hi, y'all. My name's Sabray. I work at Boise State University. I am the senior coordinator for student org engagement. I use he, him pronouns. Um, goodness, I don't have a whole website <laughs> like Ali did. I didn't know we were bringing out all the things like this, um, but I can share my screen for a little bit to show y'all what we are trying to do here. Yes, this is the one. Perfect. Um, so we do have this handbook um, that we are working on creating. Um, so for Boise State, we have um, three different pathways for our student orgs. Um, so for path one student orgs, that's just for students who just want to like come together and like hang out. So like the Pokemon club, they can just like play Pokemon all day, every day, like basic, cool. Path two is like a little bit more where they get to make money, spend money um, and do that whole thing. Path three is like when they like intense, like they want conference, they want to travel, they want to do all the things that they can do. Um, so for path two and path three, we require them to have a current Boise State faculty or staff member. Um, they can have community members, but community members are secondary to the primary Boise State faculty and staff member. Um, so this is just some of the requirements that we have here, helping our students figure out um, the right people to ask <laughs> for um, their advisor roles. 
Um, and then here are some of the guidelines that um, a lot of other people have for their advisors. I realize that our guidelines are a little brief. Um, some people I've seen have a lot of guidelines. So maybe we should like um, take a look at that. Um, some more responsibilities listed here. Um, what I get to do in the role that I'm in, um, that I was assigned to do, fall and told to do, is I get to create advisor training videos. And so I am just taking in all the information that y'all are sharing. Um, I think I want to echo what's been said about in-person. Um, it's really difficult. We had an appreciation event for our advisors. Um, similar to Maggie, I fed them, I clothed them, I gave them all the things that they needed. But like only like 10 people showed up and I was like, oh, really? Out of like 200 clubs, only 10 of y'all are going to show up? OK, I see you. Um, but anyway, uh, so maybe we're trying to transition over to like a more virtual format to um, appreciate our advisors, um, maybe like a Zoom appreciation. Maybe that would work. Um, but yeah, so I'm just here to learn and to um, take all the little tidbits from all of y'all. So I appreciate any, any help. <laughs> All right, so we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, Maggie, you have a question, a thought? A question. So does anybody have any trainings that might be differentiated? Because I have some groups who are like ginormous, like our Black Student Union here is astronomically large, which is amazing. And then we have like our American Sign Language Club, which is really small. And so she's like, I don't feel like the things that I, that you're telling one group will really apply to me. So do you have like differentiating trainings, anybody about like small or large advisor groups? It sounds like a great idea, but it's, it's a lot of work to start differentiating topics out because almost every topic, even if you're talking about fundraising, right, could be very different for a group that's five versus a group that's 100. Um, retention and recruitment can be very different. So I think that's just like a big daunting task to start catering like that. There's, there's obviously value, um, but I don't know how many of us have that many spare hours in the day to start going down that rabbit hole. Um, has anyone tried that doing like specialized? Um, I don't know if we've called it out that way. We've done like um, various types of like fundraising and recruitment videos, but we've never like tailored it specifically if you are this type of group, you should watch it, but that's a great idea. Maybe a, a dream for some other day, but. <laughs> um, hi, y'all, I'm Virginia, I'm at UT Austin. Um, I'm just gonna just ask uh, Maggie if it would be possible to do something like an asynchronous with that, that way they can kind of pick and choose. So like that might be a way to scale it based on the size of the org. So if you have um, a small org and their fundraising really looks like more getting um, bake sales, and then your larger org maybe have large alumni database and like how do you network with alumni, you could have like different modules or something like that in an asynchronous training. You know, there's even ways on YouTube. I've seen creative videos where they're almost like choose your own adventure, right? So it gets to the end and click one, and it takes you to the next video. Like you could do something like here's training that's good for everyone. And then if you're this, you know, if you're small, watch this one and it can kind of branch out and even come back together at the end, then it wouldn't require duplicating everything. You would just split out those topics that only these people need to know. So only they would click that button and watch it. Um, that's a really cool idea. And that maybe sounds a little bit more feasible than creating entire trainings, but just having kind of branching paths. Uh, that would probably be easier in a system like Canvas or Blackboard where you or learning management systems where you could do that. YouTube takes a little bit of work, um, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Or Maggie, does that? No, that definitely helps. I, since I'm already going to start doing advisor like trainings and stuff like that for virtual, I might as well just start from the beginning of doing small and large. So if we're going to do it. I'm going to do it. So I really appreciate all your ideas. Yeah, be a trendsetter and next year you can present on it and teach us how it went. Um, anyone else want to share or have a question about advisor training that you want to throw out to the group and get some feedback? Um, 
I have a question. Um, how can I get more staff involved uh, versus, not staff, I'm sorry, faculty involved versus staff? Um, it's been really hard just trying to um, extend the opportunities to staff, well, to faculty, I mean. Um, some of our staff are advisors for three and four organizations, and we really need their help across, <laughs> across the line. So how can I, you know, recruit from the faculty side? I think it's tough. I think a lot of people talked about maybe tenure incentives. Um, I know we've seen a lot of success when students ask their favorite professors. That means more than us trying to lure faculty into advice clubs. But if students just know my favorite professor, you know, for the astronomy club, they teach astronomy, I'm going to go ask them. That mm -hmm. might be an easier sell. Um, who else has had luck getting faculty to advise groups? Benny? So and maybe it just depends on the campus. I know some faculty love to and some don't. But um, in my prior institution, um, I always thought about when students were asking for an advisor, I always didn't know what to say. I looked up, oh, you're a science club. Maybe the science professor can help you. So to stop that, so what I did, I sent a mass email to the campus. It, it was a pretty generic um, you know, subject line. Hey, do you want to be an advisor for student org? And surprisingly, we got about 30 staff, faculty, you know, anyone on campus who came in. And when they came in, we just had them sign what we had our students do through Engage when they're creating their club. So, you know, you have a whole bunch of hobbies and categories. I made them fill out every single one, but now that I had that data list, so when a new club would come up to me and I would kind of check their hobbies and they had no idea for what advisor they wanted or who they needed, I would kind of cross check the advisors and the new orgs and say, oh, you guys have like five hobbies shared or you have like two hobbies shared. So I would immediately know he's willing. He showed up to my workshop. Um, this is probably someone you want to ask. So I knew at that point, I knew who to send them to and I knew they were willing to help as opposed to sending them to a professor I didn't know and probably then just blowing them off if they don't want to do it. So it was it was helpful for me to have a data list, data sheets that I knew these people were really ready to go. And before I even made a connection, I already could tell if they were, would work together or not. So maybe something like that to have a beginning of the year or beginning of the semester each semester. Hey, who wants to join an org or hey, who needs an advisor? Maybe have the two groups come together. I'm a week into my new institution position, so I haven't done anything yet. So everything I'm talking about has been in the past, but I'm hopefully I could try to integrate what I've done in the past into my new position. Yeah, I think mass emails, if you can find a way to kind of spread the word about those opportunities, that's great. Uh, our campus really cracks down on that. Like there's not really a good way to reach faculty. Um, but I think having an interest form, um, we have an interest form and we pair it with one of our training videos, which is about expectations of advisors. So people can learn about what is this exactly that I'm signing up for before they fill it out. Um, yeah, but then just getting that out to people might be tough. Uh, if you have like a faculty senate and like a, you know, like a body of faculty members that you could reach out to, they might be able to help you. Um, staff is always easier. We have a staff government body and they're always willing to help us share that, but faculty is a tougher issue. Uh, anyone else have good ideas about getting faculty on board? Hey, Adam. Um... I wanted to add uh, to your faculty senate message. Um, so I haven't had the chance to do it at my uh, new institution, but previously when I was at Cal State Fullerton, we um, started to integrate our um, <clears throat> faculty senate uh, chair um, into like uh, recognizing or awarding our advisor of the year um, as like he would or they would just uh, be asked to present. Um, and so we would get some time uh, for them to come and present the award. And that increased our faculty engagement because um, you know everybody wanted to try to impress the faculty Senate chair um, and just be present. Um, but that also gave us an in to be able to kind of message and present to faculty Senate every now and then, or even just that person stating that they were gonna present the award. It, it increased our um, engagement a little bit more. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but we definitely saw more faculty members as a result of engaging the faculty Senate. So I wanted to, echo that comment. That was good. So hopefully that helps, Kenneth, at least some ideas. 
Yes, yeah, that was a really good, great uh, idea, Tony. Thank you. Good. Uh, and then Jaina. Yes, hi, it's uh, Gina Stumba. I'm over at University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, I did have a question for y'all. I know you were talking about some Cleary trainings and some other like mandated trainings. Um, for our institution, we have to loop in a couple other areas, conduct and our university police. And that hasn't been quite as effective. And so I wanted to hear kind of what you guys are doing to make sure that you know those other entities are really geared into understanding why those uh, portions are important for advisor trainings. I can speak so little about it, but I will try. Um, for our risk management videos that are mandated, um, I speak in none of them. So we got the campus partners to make the video, which I think can be challenging. It is not the answer to your question, but the fact that I think they are um, doing it because they're the content experts and maybe like how you approach them of like this really isn't like my field of expertise my field of expertise is relaying this information to advisors but you are the expert in this so if you do this training once we'll do it again in like 10 years or whatever you know that may not be true but i think it's time for us to update ours but i think that's how we were able to engage them and so that they can only they've only done it like once and so i think every like five or six or so years we'll like redo the videos but because they're the content experts, we want the information to come from them. And so that's how we kind of approached it, but it's not the full answer to your question, so. We've had a lot of success um, when things happen, we take those opportunities to ask them for things. So when like a student group is going through conduct and we're meeting with them, we try to slip in like, well, we could create a training for all clubs. What do you think about that? You know, and like use current things that are happening to kind of prompt that. Um, like we made a really good relationship with like our Title IX office because one club was having a situation. So then we created trainings for all the clubs because they were now interested. Um, it's, I think it's tough proactively because it's not gonna be the top of their you know, to-do list. But when things happen, you can use that to like, let's take this moment now, this window of time to create something for everyone and they might see a little bit more value. Uh, so just keep a lookout for those windows. Um, but it, it is tough to get them kind of without prompt to, to do it. Yeah. Has anyone else had good luck with those kind of campus partners creating trainings? We have with our uh, building manager in order for student organizations to uh, use a uh, facility on campus, uh, we will have to uh, first be our register organization for that school year uh, but now our our facilities are now willing to work with our advisors and now allowing the students to put in their own forms because at first it had to be the advisor it couldn't be a student so giving uh that has uh, allowed it to be a better process for us on our end any other ideas or successful campus partners you've worked with to train advisors? Okay, we'll let the idea simmer. It's something probably we could all work on. Uh, we've got nine minutes. So anyone else with, yeah, hand raised, Melissa. Hi. I'm Melissa. I'm from East Stroudsburg University. Um, I have a question about like motivating um, advisors or people to be advisors. Does anyone um, have any like accolades or what does advisors get for being an advisor? Because for us, like, you know, I give them the lunch and a thank you note and I get no response. But I'm wondering if you all, maybe they get paid, maybe they get a certificate or some kind of um, what is, I guess, the carrot that you dangle to get people to be advisors? Ours is congrats, you can get tenure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> At least I know I'm not in this, you know, I'm in the same boat that we're all kind of in. Um, okay. So yeah, we just make it sound like you're being a great person. Thank you. I can, uh, for kind of building it's I don't know if it's um, a, a carrot for like being an advisor entirely but um, we had worked out with our athletics that our 
um, advisor of the year for our awards, um, uh, like recognition that the advisor of the year also got some like box seats um, for a game. Uh, I actually, they also threw out like the first pitch at a baseball game. So it was kind of a neat recognition. And we, it, this was all in coordination with them to do like a student organization day at one of the baseball games um, for us. And so we had a bunch of different recognition. So like the student org president of the year got to got some box seats as well, org advisor throughout the first pitch. Um, so I don't know if that really like recruits a lot more, but it was kind of added a unique type of recognition beyond the, the thank you cards. Um, and it was no cost to us because athletics was willing to, you know, kind of do a publicity effort. And they also threw in some food for student organizations uh, that attend student orgs that attended the game. So I wanted to say, I guess, being an advisor, you have a chance to be an advisor of the year. So if you do a student club and org recognition, I uh, might want to just juice up your advisor prize in some way. We did um, we did a giveaway once where advisors got free t-shirts. Like students, we give shirts to all the time, but staff and faculty, you'd be surprised how much like, you know, a pretty generic one color like campus shirt, like they go crazy. Um, so you can either like maybe coordinate a time, like come pick yours up, like you deserve this. Or if they're all like if primarily faculty and staff, you could even deliver them, right? And so they just out of the blue, get a package that says, thank you. And here's a shirt. I, I guess you need to get sizes uh, or do like a water bottle or something else that's easy to do. Um, so maybe next time you're doing incentives for students, you just purchase an extra bit to kind of put aside for something like that. That could work. I know I'd love if I just got a random package one day with some free stuff, like, yeah. Well, Adam, uh, Anita Roberts, Cal Poly Pomona here. Uh, we also have advisor swag and you're right. They, they really go for it. We've had t-shirts, water bottles, um, the little phone pocket thingies. <laughs> Um, and they really enjoy that. Something we've started pushing, um, well, mostly this semester, it's not necessarily just for advisors, but our um, office purchased and made like designed postcards that are thank you postcards. Um, so they're free for students to pick up. We provide stamps as well. Um, and it's a stewardship piece for like, if they have a speaker or someone come to their meeting, but we also are like, thank other people that are involved in your organization. Like if someone helped you with someone or you know, your advisor, and we've actually had a lot of foot traffic of students coming in and picking those up. So it's kind of fun and it's free for them and they're called Purdue Designs. Awesome. Well, we are about out of time. So if you haven't already put any last things in the chat. Uh, so again, I'm going to put this video up on YouTube and then all of these things will be in a Dropbox, you can download links you can click. So I don't expect you to copy and paste the chat. Uh, and then we have a break uh, from uh, the hour to whatever 30. So at 30, we've then got a half hour um, kind of mini workshop block. So take a break, go get some food, coffee, whatever you need. Uh, and thanks for coming to the summit and have a good uh, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for watching this presentation. To see other presentations, workshops, and discussions, feel free to utilize our YouTube channel or official website.